My name is Priya Luka and I am an economist of South Asian heritage working in international development. Greetings to all in Ghana listening to this contribution to the GIPRAD, the Ghana and Planet Repairs Action Dialogue. And thank you immensely to the organisers of GIPRAD for allowing me to contribute to this collation of ideas for how we consider the future that Ghanaian people face. In 1982, Ghana's leaders engineered a shift in its economic management policies, abandoning attempts to reduce financial dependency on the West. Ghana's change of direction led to an opening of a Western-led international economic system for the country. Ghana's per capita income has leapt and extreme poverty has also fallen. However, whilst Ghana's become a middle income country, the long term prospects are worrying given the over focus on extractive industries such as mining. In Ghana's case, this has meant cocoa and gold. In fact, cocoa from Ghana was Britain's second leading overseas source of colonial income, pulling in 47 million a year as London was struggling with massive post war deficit. Cocoa paid off for Britain because it kept the prices paid to African farmers for their crop artificially low while selling Ghana's cocoa at considerable profit on international markets. Ghana is also Africa's eighth largest oil producer. However, Ghana's oil output only accounts for about 3% of the country's GDP because of a lack of incomes are paid from the production process. 66 years after Ghana's independence, little of what it produces gets transformed locally beyond its raw state. This model of extraction leads to huge environmental costs too. These are the policies of neocolonialism. Dr Kwame Nkrumah, the former president of Ghana, called neocolonialism the worst form of imperialism. Over the years, the World Bank, the IMF and private banks have used the financial leverage created by Ghana's indebtedness to control economic policies. This means wage freezes, privatisation and currency devaluation. Last year, Ghana became the fourth nation to apply to the Common Framework Platform, an initiative of the G20 to streamline debt restructuring efforts for countries labelled poorer. Ghana is currently fighting its way out of an economic crisis by hiking interest rates at record speeds, cutting spending and restructuring its debt as a condition to obtain approval from the IMF's executive board. This moment is about the repair of our collective structures that protect people's right to self-determination and give countries the power to control their futures. A new $3 billion loan under the IMF's extended credit facility is being arranged at a time when the future should be about solidarity rather than further exploitation. The idea that free market liberal democracy will bring about a standard of living that's decent is not something that's manifest in any country and as we see instead there is rotating power through the same mechanisms. As elections draw near in Ghana, a vision of alternative economics becomes crucial. We see that extent of disrepair and the current level of inflation, which has now hit 54% as food and fuel costs surge. Many households will be concerned about running out of food while a weak social security system further risks marginalising households that have low income and informal sector workers. We know that it's generally people who benefit from capitalist and patriarchal systems who are involved in designing and running economies and the people who are most harmed by those systems who are excluded about by them. There is a curation of economic thinking that provides a logic for this and the hegemonic control of the creation of knowledge. This is all at the time when people and their movements are in need of space to heal and tend to the grief and wounds of rupture, displacement from their land and violence. What could redistribution look like if we recognise repair for the colonial harm imposed on Ghana? As you fight the ongoing commodification of the natural environment, I stand in solidarity and offer my support. Exposing market-driven development embedded in structural adjustment policies through reimagining policy reinvention and revolution via decolonial voices is important. Recla reclaiming ancestral and public land and returning its management to indigenous communities and more broadly through guarantees of non-repetition under the UN rep reparations framework is also crucial. I'd like to end by saying our mutual connections matter in the journey towards decolonised economic futures. 
Thank you for listening and I look forward to our further engagement on these issues and any support I can offer to you.